meeting is being recorded. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Kayla Marino, and I'm with the Virginia SBDC Network. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with our organization, the Virginia Small Business Development Center is a partnership between U.S. Small Business Administration, George Mason University, and local host institutions throughout Virginia. We, uh, with 27 locations across the Commonwealth, we provide training and technical assistance to small businesses in their local communities. Our one-on-one -on -one consulting services are available at no charge. Uh, today's webinar, Intellectual Property 101, is presented by the Virginia SBDC Network in collaboration with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Uh, be sure to check out the next webinar in the series, Patent Basics, on Tuesday, April 12th. Uh, we are recording today's presentation, and it will be posted on our website, virginiasbdc.org. Due to the large number of participants, everyone's microphone is muted, uh, but if you have questions during the presentation, you can type them in the Q&A box, and we will be enabling the live transcript function, um, which you can show or hide via your meeting controls. Um, and now it is my pleasure to introduce our presenter for today's session. As the Eastern Regional Outreach Director for the U.S. Patent and Trade Office, Elizabeth Doherty came, carries out the strategic direction of the Undersecretary of Commerce for Intellectual Property and the Director of the USPTO, and is responsible for leading the USPTO's East Coast stakeholder engagement. Uh, focusing on the region and actively engaging with the community, Ms. Doherty ensures the USPTO's initiatives and programs are tailored to the region's unique ecosystem of industries and stakeholders. So please welcome me in joining our presenter for today, Elizabeth Doherty. Thank you, Kayla. Thank you for that warm welcome and good morning, good afternoon from wherever you're tuning in from. Uh, it is my pleasure on behalf of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office to again join with our collaborators at the Virginia SBDC to bring you this webinar series on intellectual property. Uh, kicking it off today, we are going to talk about the basics of intellectual property. What is it? What's its role? Why is it important? Uh, particularly helping those of you who are just considering dipping your toe in the pool of intellectual property. What do you need to know? Uh, and again, what is, why is it important? Uh, as Kayla said, my name is Elizabeth Doherty. I'm a 30-year veteran of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Uh, having started my career as a patent examiner, did legal policy work, but the real joy in my, and pleasure in what I'm doing uh, now is the fact that I get to engage with audiences such as yourself. I get to engage directly with stakeholders each and every day. Uh, my team and I are in the Eastern Regional Outreach Office, which is located uh, when we're in the office at our headquarters in Alexandria, Virginia, and our work mirrors that of the other regional offices. The U.S. Patent and Trademark Office has regional offices in Detroit, Denver, Dallas, and San Jose, and again, as I said, my team and I are in the Alexandria, Virginia headquarters. Um, so with that, we are going to jump right into these materials. I do welcome your questions in the chat. My colleague Bobby Rushing is on with me today. He'll try and answer some of those questions directly in the chat, or he'll shout them out live and we'll try and answer them during the presentation or at the end. Again, welcome and glad to have you with us uh, for this adventure. Bobby, let's go ahead and start moving our slides forward. Just to let you know, um, this information today does not constitute legal advice. My team and I cannot serve as uh, your intellectual property attorney in providing with you with legal advice, but this is educational, informational, and we hope is going to help demystify the process of the role and importance of intellectual property. Next slide, please. So as I said, today, what are we going to talk about? Well, we're going to talk about intellectual property as a business strategy. Um, knowing that many of you may be uh, starting or considering starting a small business, or maybe are already in the throes of creating and building and growing a small business, why is intellectual property important to you? What is it? Who is the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office? I tell you, we're an unsung hero in the federal government. But then we're also going to round out our conversation today with some USPTO resources, uh, really just an introduction, because the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office has so many valuable resources for our inventors, innovators, and entrepreneurs. I want to make sure that you're aware of them. That will also be part of this series with the Virginia uh, SBDC uh, webinar series program. So uh, that, that class specifically will do a deeper dive, but we're going to touch on some of them today. Next slide, please. 
So let's start by looking at intellectual property from the 30,000 foot level, because then we're going to take it down and do a much deeper dive. But IP is a business strategy. And when I say that, what I mean by that is that you as a small business owner or someone contemplating being a small business owner should have intellectual property in the forefront of your business plan. It should be something that you consider each step of the way as you develop your business. And why is that true? It's true because sometimes, unfortunately, by delaying and protecting your intellectual property, you in fact can preclude yourself from protecting your intellectual property. And you'll see that as we discuss the various concepts of IP today. So what is it that IP brings value to a business? Well, it can be attractive to investors and buyers because just like real property, intellectual property infuses in your business financial value. Uh, it's no different than having real property assets. Intellectual property assets can bring uh, value, financial value, making your company attractive to investors and buyers. By having intellectual property and by putting the world on notice that you have protected your intellectual property, you can potentially deter infringement lawsuits by using the circle with the R, by using the circle with the C, by putting your US patent number on a product, you are alerting people to the fact that you have not only created intellectual property, but you have protected it and that they should stay away from it or only use it with your permission. Just as IP is attractive to investors and buyers, it can increase leveraging power again by adding financial value into your business. Um, additionally, it is global. For many businesses today, they are looking to work in a global environment. In fact, if anyone is uh, looking to sell or offer services on the internet, you are really joining in a global marketplace. Um, so we'll talk more about the global aspect of intellectual property, but also talk about the territorial aspect of intellectual property as we move through the slides today. Next slide, please. So what is intellectual property? Well, let's take a little bit of a step back and juxtapose it against real property. Real property is a concept we can all understand and appreciate. It's that house you own. It's that car, that boat, that tangible property that offers financial, uh, that, that, cause, that is at a cost, but also brings financial uh, incentives and financial assets to your ownership. Intellectual property, like real property, has a financial value to it, but it is property of the mind. It is property that you and perhaps others have worked together to create. And it is something that is protected by various forms of intellectual property protection, patents, trademarks, copyrights, trade secrets. And we'll talk about each one of those specifically. So again, intellectual property is that creative property, the property that has been created by intellectual endeavors, created by the mind. Next slide, please. So what is the US Patent and Trademark Office? Well, uh, we are oftentimes known as the uh, National uh, Innovation Agency. Uh, we are perhaps one of the oldest federal agencies, if not the oldest agency. There's a little bit of competitive rivalry amongst uh, several agencies, but our work in fact began in 1790 with the issuance of the first patent law. The work of the US Patent and Trademark Office is written into the very US Constitution itself. And we'll talk more specifically about that in just a moment. Uh, we are a federal agency, which is part of the US Department of Commerce. Uh, again, we began our work in 1790. We have our USPTO headquarters, which you can see there, uh, located in Alexandria, Virginia. And we have our regional offices in Detroit, Denver, Dallas, and San Jose. Next slide, please. As you can see from these statistics about our agency, we are a nearly 13,000 person agency. Yet, sadly, we are one of the best kept secrets of the federal government. I always like to say that you and I, we enjoy the lives we do because of patented technologies and trademark registered goods and services. Uh, ass I assure you, we would not recognize the lives we have without those two forms of intellectual property. From the food we eat to the clothes we wear and the car we drive, all protected by intellectual property. 
If one were to look at the US Patent and Trademark Office, um, you can see that the bulk of our employees work in the area of patent protection. We have over 8,000 trained engineers and scientists reviewing US patent applications every day of the week, helping American and global inventors and innovators protect their intellectual property. We similarly have uh, nearly uh, 1,000 trademark examining attorneys, because I think that number is actually a little bit out of date. Because when you look to the right on this slide, you can see that each and every year for the last decade, we have received over 650,000 patent applications, and we are now rapidly approaching nearly a million trademark applications being filed. I like to say that's a lot of creativity going on, both in the area of patents and trademarks. Um, again, we are headquartered in Alexandria, Virginia, but our employees are teleworkers across the nation. Um, we actually lead the federal government in uh, telework. We have always been the gold standard in telework. So even during this pandemic, these challenging times, our employees have been working fast and furiously to protect, uh, again, the rights of US patent holders and trademark regist registrants. Uh, next slide, please. As I mentioned, our work began with the very start of our nation. The Founding Fathers, when uh, establishing our nation and in fact drafting the US Constitution, they recognized from a historical perspective that in order for us to be a strong and industrialized nation, we needed to in fact protect and secure for limited times to authors and inventors, inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. And we did just that by placing this language into the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8. This is what is called the Patent and Copyright Clause of the Constitution. Now, trademarks are also written into the US Constitution, but they are inherently found within the Commerce Clause. So again, patents, trademarks, copyrights, all inherent to the very growth of our nation. And it is one thing that has, in fact, led us to be such a creative nation. It has led us to be an industry leader and to be a technology leader across the globe because we do recognize and support our authors and inventors. Next slide, please. So today we're gonna to talk about the four basic types of intellectual property and we're gonna march through all of these. And it may seem overwhelming for those who are just introducing themselves to intellectual property, but I want the takeaway here to be uh, two main things. One, that there are four different basic types of intellectual property and that they protect very different things. Now, if we can add a third thing in there as a takeaway, it would be that these last for very different durations. So let's keep that in mind. Again, we're gonna talk about patents, trademarks, copyrights, and trade secrets. Another thing that's important to keep in mind, we'll add a fourth thing to your list for today, but I know you guys are a savvy audience and this won't be too much, um, is oftentimes, a business is creating what we would call an intellectual property portfolio. You may be creating a property portfolio that has one or multiple forms of intellectual property within that portfolio to protect the endeavors of your business. Um, nearly every, if not every business has something protectable by a trademark. Every business and every individual has something that is protectable by a copyright. Patents and trade secrets that may depend, that may depend on what your endeavor is. So patents, as we're gonna talk about, uh, we're gonna do a deeper dive on each one of these. Patents protect what we think of as inventions, new and inventive ideas. Trademarks are the indicator of goods and services. They identify the origin of those goods and services. Copyrights are creative expressions stored in a tangible form. And trade secrets are any information that is both valuable and kept confidential by a business. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna march through each of these uh, and get do a little bit of a deeper dive, just again, to familiarize yourself with what each one protects, the duration of it, and why it is valuable. All right, Bobby, let's get rolling. Let's do trade secrets first. Oh, but before we do that, uh, as I said, you may be creating an intellectual property portfolio in your endeavor. Here's a great example of how that uh, happens with just one device, one commercialized device, in this instance, a mobile phone, you can see the potential for multiple forms of intellectual property within one simple device. 
if you were the creation of this phone, uh, if you were the creator, and in fact, the one who is commercializing, producing, and selling this phone, you probably have one or more trademarks that protect your business, that protect the name of the phone, that protect the name of perhaps the software that's being used. You probably also have patented technology that is within that phone and probably multiple forms of intellectual property patents that are within that phone. Uh, there's a lot of complexity in uh, mobile phones these days. Um, copyrights, of course, trade secrets potentially and designs. When we say designs, we mean design patents. And you'll see when we talk about patents that design patents protect the ornamental appearance of an article of manufacture. So not only are there patents, trademarks, copyrights, and trade secrets, but there are multiple types of patents. But we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get right into the conversation about patents. Next slide, please. So as I said, we're gonna jump right into trade secrets and trade secrets are fascinating. And here are two uh, often considered examples of trade secrets. What is that recipe that makes that uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken taste so delicious? Well, arguably none of us know because we don't know. They've been able to maintain that recipe as a secret. Um, additionally, when one types in search terms into the Google search bar, how does that Google search algorithm turn around results that are pertinent to the terms that you were searching? Well, again, no one knows because Google has been able to maintain their search algorithm as a secret. So trade secrets are incredibly valuable because in part of their duration. Trade secrets, as long as they can continue to bring value to a business and can be maintained as a secret, can last forever. Again, another one that people frequently think of is the recipe for Coca-Cola. So what is inherently important to a trade secret? Next slide, please. Well, ultimately, what is important and uh, part of the prescription of a trade secret is that the information that is being maintained as a secret is commercially valuable proprietary information. Again, it brings value to a business and it is important to the role uh, and the work of that business. So whether it's the recipe for KFC, um, it is the recipe for Coca-Cola or the Google search algorithm, it is valuable proprietary information giving a competitive advantage. Some would say that that KFC chicken is better than any other chicken on the marketplace because of that secret blend of spices. Um, trade secrets are not generally known. It must be subject to reasonable efforts to preserve confidentiality. As the name itself suggests, um, the value is in fact that you have been able to maintain it as a secret. So how does one maintain a trade secret? Well, there's a lot of different ways. Um, perhaps, for example, with a recipe, not every employee has access to that recipe. It's said, and this could be an urban legend, it's said that not one employee at Coca-Cola knows the entire recipe for Coca-Cola, that the recipe is broken down amongst a number of employees, or perhaps that trade secret element, whether it's a customer list, a recipe, or an algorithm, perhaps it is kept in a locked vault, perhaps it is kept in a locked safe, perhaps it is kept someplace where only limited access to authorized individuals is maintained. Now, interestingly, Common ways to lose a trade secret, perhaps most well known is reverse engineering or independent development. Now, could one of us um, as, a, as a food chemist, perhaps determine a formula for a carbonated beverage that tastes like Coca-Cola? Perhaps with enough experimentation, someone might in fact be able to develop that recipe. Now, whether we would know if it's the exact formula or not, uh, that would be tough to discern. Um, but again, the importance of trade secrets is that they are maintained secret. Now, trade secrets are protected by the Uniform Trade Secret Act, which was passed by Congress, but they are also protected by contract law, generally between an employer and an employee. So keep in mind, trade se secrets are incredibly valuable because of their potential duration, but they are also incredibly difficult to maintain because you have to put reasonable means in place to preserve that confidentiality. Next slide, Bobby. 
All right, we're going to move right on to copyrights, and copyrights are fascinating. So we are the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Bobby and I both are employees of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, so you may say to yourself, well, where do copyrights come in? Well, there is, in fact, the U.S. Copyright Office, which is distinct from the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. The U.S. Copyright Office is part of the Library of Congress. However, with that said, we would not be doing you a good service to not talk about copyrights today. And additionally, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office has a role to play in advising the administration on copyright policy. So we cooperate with our colleagues at the U.S. Copyright Office and also have a role to play, again, in the policy aspect. So what is a copyright? Well, if I were there in person with all of you, I would ask all of you to raise your hand if you own a copyright. And what I would hope to see is all of you raise your hand. Because if you've ever written a letter, you've written a poem, you've written a song, you've done a sculpture, you've taken a photograph, you in fact have a copyright. Because copyrights are what we call self-authenticating. By merely creating this creative work, a story, a poem, a song, a photograph, you in fact have created the work, you have fixed it in a tangible medium, but what we're gonna talk about today is why would you register that copyright? Because you can and are encouraged to register that copyright with the Library of Congress. You are encouraged to register that copyrighted work. So copyright is a legal protection for the authors of original works of authorship. And that's important, the original works of authorship, including a wide variety of things, literary, dramatic, musical, artistic, and certain other intellectual works. Next slide, please. So what works are protected? They must be creative, they must be original, and they must be fixed in a tangible form. Um, the fixation need not be directly perceptible as long as it may be communicated with the aid of a machine or a device. So when we say fixed in a tangible form, it could be writing that uh, letter or that term paper on a piece of paper. It could be actually uh, putting that, uh, that material on a thumb drive you are placing it in a fixed and tangible form. You are storing it in such a way that it is fixed in a tangible form. For a sculptor, it could be perhaps clay. It could be metal. It could be some type of, again, fixed tangible form. Next slide, please. So what works are protected? Again, we said it has to be fixed in a tangible medium. It must be original, meaning that the work has been independently created by the author. Next slide, please. So as we said, copyrights can protect a wide array of things. Think about, think about things that are creative works placed in a fixed and tangible medium, literary works, musical works, sound recordings, dramatic works, choreographic works pictorial, graphic, and sculptural works, motion pictures, architectural works. So it's a wide array of things. Um, and again, the copyright is self-authenticated, self-authenticating in producing it, placing it in that fixed and tangible medium. But you, we're gonna discuss why you should register that with the US Copyright Office. And in fact, if you should, it's gonna depend on that work and what you hope to do with it. Next slide, please. So there are also works from pre-existing works. Now, remember, we said that it has to be an original work of creativity. Um, but sometimes people can take original works of creativity and place them into something called a compilation. And that can also achieve a copyright. So think about it. Perhaps you took a series of poems written by a variety of authors. Those authors all have a copyright in their poem. However, you create a compilation work of poems on nature. Now, you haven't written any of those poems. They have been written by other authors, but you have created a compilation work of a uh, collection of poems about nature. You could achieve a copyright in your compilation work. Derivative works are, uh, are similar. Uh, some of you may be too young to know the names Weird Al Yankovic. Weird Al Yankovic, and I think he's still producing music today. He would oftentimes take creative, popular songs, change the words, but keep this, the music the same, 
but change the words to have a funny or different meaning. Uh, that's a great example of a derivative work. Next slide, please. Works that are not protected. So it's important to know that, again, they have to be fixed in a tangible form of expression. So works that are not protected are works that have not been fixed. Titles, names, familiar symbols, or designs, mere variations of letterings, listings of ingredients, or content. So what if you sat down this morning and you wrote yourself a grocery list? Could you obtain a copyright in your grocery list? Uh, the answer is probably no. However, if that mere listing, that mere listing of grocery store items actually included a doodle, or perhaps you drew a cartoon in the, 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 uh, the margin of your grocery list, or perhaps you added a recipe uh, of something that you are going to try and create from that grocery list of ingredients, could that be copyrightable? Perhaps, because perhaps it, it enhanced the level of creativity so that it was no longer a mere listing or a mis mere listing of ingredients or contents. Um, one cannot protect ideas, procedures, concepts, or principles uh, and works consisting entirely of common property containing no original authorship. I'll give you a great example. Years ago, there was a, uh, a, a case that went uh, to court about could you copyright a phone book? Could you copyright the content in a phone book? Did it have the requisite level of creativity? I'll leave you to do a little super sleuthing to find the answer to that. Next slide, please. So terms of a copyright. Let's bounce quickly back to trade secrets. As you recall, trade secrets are incredibly valuable because their duration can be forever if the information continues to provide financial value to a company and can be maintained as a secret. So what is the life of a copyright? Well, copyrights have a very extensive duration, but not forever. As you can see, they are the life of the author plus 70 years. In other words, the creator of a copyrighted work enjoys the benefit of their copyright, and it can also pass to their heirs for an additional 70 years. Um, so again, an extensive duration, um, so making it incredibly valuable. Next slide, please. So what rights fall to a copyright owner? As the creator of that copyrighted work, what does that copyright allow you to do? It, it, it allows you to have the exclusive right. Remember going back to that language of the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8, the uh, the author has the right, the exclusive right to re re reproduce the work, prepare derivative works, distribute copies, perform the work, display the work, or importantly, authorize others to do so. And this is perhaps where some of the greatest monetary value comes in by authorizing others to do so, authorizing others to license your work. You can perhaps sell your work to others. So again, uh, an incredible value in intellectual property coming from that opportunity that you are the owner and you have the ability to control its use for its duration, which again for copyrights is life of the author plus 70 years. Next slide, please. So why register? Because remember, as I said, copyrights are self-authenticating. So why go to the trouble of going to the US Copyright Office and registering your copyright? Well, I think it depends. It depends on what you hope to do with your copyrighted work. Um, if, again, you were just writing a letter to your mom, then no, you probably uh, might not uh, take the, the trouble and effort and financial outlay to register it with the U.S. Copyright Office. However, if you have created a beautiful poem, you have created a beautiful song or a work of sculpture, and you do want to, to share it or perhaps license it or sell it or whatever you choose to do as the owner, registration with the U.S. Copyright Office puts others on notice of your copyright claim. Registration is in fact required to file suit in federal court. So if someone is copying your work, you want it to be registered with the US Copyright Office so you can protect it. Registration also serves as prima facie evidence of the validity of the copyright. Um, by registering, you can take that registration to the US Customs and Border Protection to help prevent importation of pirated products. Uh, all, all too often we are seeing people that are creating unlicensed copies 
this would allow you to go to Customs and Border Protection and put on file your registration so that they know to be looking for things coming into this country that are, have not been produced by you. Uh, statutory damages and attorney fees may be claimed in courts if you have a registration. And it is easier, simply easier to license your work, collect royalties and enforce your rights. I will say that registration with the US Copyright Office is relatively easy and relatively inexpensive, particularly when compared with patents and trademarks. So with that, I think we're just about out of the woods on, on copyrights, but let's see. Bobby, next slide, please. Ah, very good. We've now moved on to trademarks, one of my favorite topics. So what is a trademark? Well, they say on average, and I think this number is probably in fact low, is we interact with at least 1,500 trademarks every day on a given daily basis, just by enjoying the world that we do, by going down the street, going to the grocery store. Again, I think that's number that number is probably a little bit low. If we were all to look at the clothes we're wearing, the things that are in our purse or in our, our book bag, you're going to see a lot of trademarks. Trademarks are the indicator of the source of goods and services. So any word, name, symbol, or device used to identify and distinguish goods and services. As you can see from this slide, you see a number of well-known uh, trademarks. Now, when you see the TM and the SM, that is an indicator of a trademark that is being used that has not been federally registered. It is only when one federally registers with the US Patent and Trademark Office that one can use the circle with the R. Now, with that said, one can have uh, a state or a common law trademark by merely using that mark in commerce or pursuing through uh, state trademark registration, a state trademark. However, one of the benefits of the federally registered trademark, and we'll talk about this more specifically up ahead, is that if you are participating in interstate commerce, again, selling your products or services across the nation, you really want to be thinking about that federally registered trademark. But the TM and the SM indicate that uh, someone either has a common law trademark or a state trademark, not a federally registered trademark. Next slide, please. So what do trademarks offer? Trademarks, again, provide an indication, an identification of the origin of goods and services. So it can serve to provide brand recognition, distinguishing goods or services from competitors in the marketplace. Um, I think, again, if we go to back to our grocery store example, think about any time you've walked down any aisle in your grocery store. I always think of the cereal aisle. How does one know to find in that lengthy aisle of a variety of breakfast cereal products, how do you know to find the one that you like, the one that you have identified and eaten year after year? Well, it's based upon the trademarks, the trademarks that indicate the source of goods and services. Trademarks really create a two-way street. They create an opportunity for a brand to create brand recognition, and it also protects consumers. By protecting, it protects consumers because it encourages brand owners to maintain high quality in order to encourage uh, consumers to come back time and time again to their product. Trademarks offer public notice of ownership. Again, that circle with the R alerts people to the fact that you have a federally registered trademark. Um, it is, provides you with the right to enforce nationally and bring legal action. Um, the right to record the, the mark with customs just as we discussed with copyrights, serve as a basis for foreign filing. And by having that federally registered trademark, you are placed in our US trademark database. And again, when others are looking to create a trademark, they will know that they need to stay away from your trademark, that you already have that mark and are using it. Next slide, please. So what is the definition of a trademark? Uh, it can be a wide combination of things that is um, that are uh, used to, to indicate trademarks. Uh, a word, a slogan, a symbol, a design, or a combination thereof that identifies the source of goods or services. Um, and it distinguishes yours from others. So uh, let's take a look at some examples. Uh, I know we had a slide already that provided some, but let's look at some additional examples. 
here, uh, going to a significant trademark holder, um, look at several examples of trademarks owned by the Coca-Cola company. Tra uh, the Coca-Cola company, in fact, once went on record having saying that they could lose all of their hard copy assets, their bottling facilities, their trucks, their inventory, as long as they maintain their trademark portfolio, they still had the majority of the financial value in the company because their brands are so strong and so recognized across the globe. You can see the word mark, composition mark, special form mark, design mark. Um, and this is just scratching the surface of the trademark portfolio of the Coca-Cola company. Next slide, please. So again, some additional examples. And we have some what we call non-traditional trademarks. They can be things such as sounds, colors, or smells, even uh, an appearance. Take, for example, the shape of the Hershey Kiss. That is trademark. Take, for example, what can Brown do for you? Not only do they have a slogan, which protects UPS, but the brown of the trucks and the brown of the uniforms has been identified as a trademark for packaging services. Um, so again, there's a wide variety of these also non-traditional trademarks, maybe heard or seen or used less often than words, slogans, symbols, and designs, but still valuable for identifying the source of goods and services. Next slide, please. So when picking your mark uh, as the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, we want to encourage you to have a strong mark. So you can see here on this sliding scale of marks, the strongest types of trademarks are those that are fanciful or arbitrary. The next strongest are those that are suggestive and then subsequently descriptive or generic. Now, things that are deemed to be generic by the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office can in fact not serve as a trademark. You cannot receive a federal registered trademark for generic terms. Let's look at some examples of fanciful, arbitrary, suggestive, and descriptive so that you know when starting and trying to create your brand, when trying to create your trademark, which direction should you go in and what would be helpful to know? Next slide, please. So here's some examples. So fanciful, fanciful trademarks are invented words that merely serve the purpose of serving as a trademark. Xerox, Microsoft, Cisco, these words have no meaning outside of serving as a trademark. They are completely invented words that did not have a previous meaning in our lexicography. They were not words that have been repurposed. They are words that were created simply to serve as a trademark. Arbitrary, the next strongest type of uh, mark is actual words, but words do, that don't convey any association with the goods and services. So while the words Apple, Gap, and Blackberry all have a actual dictionary definition, Apple and Blackberry, both types of fruit, Gap, um, uh, the distance between uh, two items, uh, these words are used in a very different way when used as a trademark. Apple for uh, computer products and services, Gap for clothing, Blackberry for IT goods and services. So again, actual words, but they don't convey any association with the goods and services that they are representing when they are serving as a trademark. Suggestive, again, keep in mind, we're going down that list from strongest to weakest. Suggestive are good trademarks, um, but again, they are not as strong as our fanciful or arbitrary. They suggest a quality or intended desire or effect for goods and services. Take, for example, copper tone, dry foot, ever ready. Next slide, please. Descriptive, again, kind of almost reaching the bottom rung of the strength of a trademark. Words or designs that describe the goods or services. Um, they're harder to protect than are fanciful or arbitrary. Um, so let's keep in mind, you want to be on that higher end of the scale. And then of course, generic are common everyday names for goods and services that cannot serve as a trademark. They cannot be registered as a trademark. Next slide, please. So why register? This is a conversation very similar to the one we had about copyrights. 
because by federally registering your trademark, you can have nationwide protection. If using your mark in, in uh, international, not international, I'm sorry, interstate commerce, it provides constructive notice of right to use. Uh, the USPTO will refuse later filed applications. It, it then also places you in our searchable database. Statutory damages and attorney's fees, uh, ability to provort, prevent the importation of infringing goods, counterfeit goods, a significant problem. This goes back to working with customs and border protection. Um, so keep in mind, great value in registering your trademark with the US Patent and Trademark Office. Next slide, please. All right, we're going to bring it home with a conversation about patents. And then, like I said, we're going to talk about a few of the resources available to you through the US Patent and Trademark Office. So what is a patent? A patent is the right to exclude others from making, using, selling, offering for sale, or importing your claimed invention. Um, again, patents protect what we think of as inventions, and we're going to talk more specifically about that. Just like copyrights and trademarks, they are for a limited period of time. And it occurs to me that I didn't share with you the limited term of a trademark. So trademarks um, have a unique uh, duration in that they are good for 10 years. However, a trademark can last forever if one continues to use the mark in commerce and renews it every 10 years. So it's similar to a trade secret in that it's value, it's Duration can be forever. However, it's uh, one that must be continually used in commerce and continually renewed uh, in a 10 year cycle. The patent, like a copyright, has a limited term, and we're going to talk more about that. Patents, like all other forms of intellectual property, are territorial, meaning they only protect you within the country that issues you that right. So, types of patents, as I alluded to earlier, there are three different types of patents. Utility, which protect what we generally think of as inventions, a new mousetrap, a new toothbrush, a new mobile phone. Design patents, which protect the way a product or article looks, the ornamental expression. Utility patents and plant patents are good for 20 years from the date of filing. Design patents, differently and distinctively different, are good for 15 years from the date of grant. Now recall when we talked about creating an IP portfolio, if you are creating an article of manufacture, let's say a new toothbrush, you've invented a great new toothbrush, you may want to consider getting both a utility and a design patent to protect the very two different aspects of that invention, how the invention works, functions, or is made, and how it looks. Next slide, please. So how does one know if your idea is eligible for protection? Well. Uh, the laws regarding patents have set forth that in order for your invention to be patentable, it must meet several criteria. One of which is, is it a process, machine, manufacture, composition of matter, or improvement thereon? If so, it is potentially eligible for protection. Next slide. Now, additionally, in order to be one of those categories, in order to receive a US patent, your invention has to be novel or new, not previously known, not previously known in the prior art, prior art meaning published and publicly available information pertinent to the patentability of your invention. Your invention also must be non-obvious, meaning the differences between your invention and the prior art would not have just been an obvious variation. And does it have a utility? Does it serve a useful purpose? Next slide, please. So what is not patentable? Well, one cannot patent a mere idea. Now, what does this mean exactly? Well, I'll give you an example. I have a great idea, or I think I have a great idea. I would like to build a time machine because I'd love to go back in time and meet fantastic people like Abraham Lincoln and Harriet Tubman. Now, do I have an invention or do I have an idea? I have an idea. I do not have an invention because I am not in possession of that invention such that I can describe it with such specificity that others can make and use my invention. So what does that mean? I have an idea which could be developed into a new non-obvious and useful machine manufacturer process or composition of matter. Can I actually accomplish that task? No, I am not in possession 
of the knowledge necessary for that to happen. Um, so I have a mere idea. You can also not patent natural phenomenon or abstract ideas. Now, going back to you cannot patent an idea, does that mean you actually have to have a working prototype? The answer is no. But again, you must be able to describe, describe in your patent application, your invention with such specificity that others can make and use your invention. Next slide, please. So what is the path to a patent? Well, of course, it starts with an idea. But again, one must develop it beyond a new idea. Now, one may choose to file something called a provisional patent application. This is not a required step, but it is a step that oftentimes people take prior to filing that non-provisional patent application. Uh, if one files the non-provisional patent application, that is what is examined by a US patent examiner and can result in a US patent. Next slide, please. So what is a provisional patent application versus a non-provisional? Well, as I said, the non-provisional is examined by a US examiner and can result in a patent. The provisional is really a helpful tool uh, because it's a lower bar of entry and a lower cost of entry. Um, and it allows one to use the term patent pending and put something on file with the office. Now, the caution here is that this provisional patent application while maintained in confidence is only good for one year. If one wants to then go on and seek a US patent, one needs to file that non-provisional application. And if you want to take advantage of that earlier filing, you need to file that non-provisional within the one year time limit. Um, provisional patent applications are a great tool, a great uh, first step, but again, I, I always issue a word of caution. Just be sure you know that the provisional patent application is not a patent. Um, with respect to the patent application roadmap, this just reflects to you that it is a process of communication and collaboration with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. When you file your patent application or your patent attorney or patent agent does so, it begins a process with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office where you interact with an examiner and you have a conversation and collaboration because we want what you want. We want to issue you a valid U.S. patent that you can take to the bank and not to the courthouse. Next slide, please. So let's quickly hit some USPTO resources and then I want to be sure and leave time for any questions you might have. For those of you particularly who are just getting started in understanding intellectual property, I strongly encourage you to visit our website, www.uspto.gov. Come and check us out. Now, I'll tell you, we have so much information, it can be difficult to find. Um, so I do like to encourage people to start at a couple of places first and foremost. One of which is that learning and resources pull down tab, which is located across the top toolbar. That's a great entrance uh, into education for inventors, entrepreneurs, startups, kids, and teachers. Uh, I also encourage people to look at that finding direct resources in your geographic area, because that's where you're going to find state specific resources. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, my team and I are located at the USPTO headquarters in Alexandria, Virginia, but we do as a result of the America Invents Act of 2011, have regional offices in Detroit, Denver, Dallas, and San Jose. Next slide, please. Uh, as I mentioned, when one selects a state resource page, you are going to get a drop down menu that looks just like this. And what you're going to find is free patent and trademark legal assistance in your area. And that is going to include the patent pro bono program that services the state you're in. And for Virginia, that is the patent pro bono program out of the Federal Circuit Bar Association out of DC. You're also going to find their law school clinic programs, which offer for free and reduced reduce cost legal services for under-resourced applicants. For the state of Virginia, uh, you can seek assistance through American University, Howard University, Liberty University, and the University of Richmond Law School. Through this, uh, this state resource page, you're also going to find um, information about the Patent and Trademark Resource Center in your area. And that, in fact, would be uh, visiting the USPTO headquarters. And uh, you're going to find the network of inventor and entrepreneur organizations that are closest to you. And for the state of Virginia, it's going to be INCA, Inventors of the National Capital Area, and VINE, the Virginia Innovators Network. Next slide, please. 
For those of you who are visual learners, and that might be many, if not all of you, because you've tuned into our, our virtual webinar today, we do have a YouTube channel that has a great wealth of resources from the USPTO, uh, pre-recorded sessions or sessions that were recorded simply for the um, place on our YouTube channel. Next slide, please. We also have our USPTO Subscription Center, and you can find all of these subscriptions just by typing the word subscription into our toolbox, uh, into the search box on our homepage. Uh, these, these USPTO subscriptions drop information into your inbox only when we have something important to say. We don't sell your email, we don't give it away, and we will not spam you. Uh, we only provide you with relevant information when we have, again, something significant to say. Next slide, please. Our USPTO events webpage. I, I have to strongly encourage this, and you can find it again from that learning and resources pull down tab. Each and every day, Monday through Friday, we have multiple courses going, um, such as the course we're doing today, but a wealth of courses taught from experts across our agency. Uh, today, in fact, if you were to visit our USPTO events page, you would see that we are again kicking off our eight part trademark bootcamp series. Uh, which has been offered a number of times through the year. It's an eight part series and we are kicking it off again with part number one. Um, and you'll find, as I said, a wealth of free events uh, that you can register for. These events currently are all virtual uh, and will likely always have a virtual component, um, but you will also find uh, some listings for in-person events when we do return to in-person events. Um, but I've got to encourage you, these programs are all free and again, offered Monday through Friday. Next slide, please. Startup resources, uh, again, a great one-stop shop. And you can find this by typing startup in our top search bar. You'll see when you go to our startup resources page that we've created this as a one-stop shop for getting your toe wet as a startup, as a small business. What do you need to know with respect to intellectual property? patents for startups, trademarks for startups, startup assistance, current events. This leads you back to that events page that we just took a look at. Next question, please. Uh, our, our Inventors and Assistance Center, our IAC. I can't recommend our IAC strongly enough. For those of you who are starting down the road of perhaps seeking a patent or are already in the process and you have questions, our Inventors Assistance Center is staffed Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 8, by retired U.S. employees, some of whom have had 30 and 40 year careers. They love to get your questions. You can email or call. Next slide, please. Similarly, we also have our Trademark Assistance Center also staffed Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 8. They love to get your questions. Again, whether you are considering filing for a trademark registration or you are already in process or perhaps already have your trademark and you have a question, these folks are there to answer your questions by phone or by email and they love to hear from you. Next slide, please. Our U.S. Patent Pro Bono Program, and this I've alluded to when we talked about the state resources page. As a result of the 2011 America Invents Act, Congress urged the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office to join with legal associations across the nation to stand up patent pro bono programs so that financially under-resourced inventors were not leaving inventions on the kitchen table or the garage workbench. So the USPTO did just that. We, in fact, stood up state or regional pro bono programs, which now cover the entirety of the U.S. Now, in order to take advantage of these resources, and the resource is free legal services, one must meet certain criteria. Because these resources are limited, we want them to be available to those that need it most. Program participants must have an income of 300 percent below the federal poverty guidelines. They must pay USPTO fed filing fees and costs. So the filing fees and costs are not waived, but you are receiving free legal services. You must demonstrate a knowledge of the patent system, and one can do that by filing a provisional patent application on your own or by taking a training course on our website. And you will also have to have your application pre-screened by the patent pro bono program you are applying to. Next slide, please. As you can see, uh, as I mentioned, we do have state or regional patent pro bono programs which cover the entirety of our nation. 
for those of you who are in Virginia, you'll see that, as I said, you are covered by the Federal Circuit Bar Association, which covers Maryland, DC, and Virginia with respect to providing free legal services in the area of patents. Next slide, please. Uh, as I mentioned, the Law School Clinic Program provides free or reduced cost of legal services through law schools where students are supervised by a registered practitioner or professor. Um, these offer assistance both in the area of patents or trademarks, or in some instances, both. Um, so when you visit the state resource page, you'll find the law schools that are closest to you that are participating. It will also provide an indication if they are participating in the area of patents or trademarks or patents and trademarks. So while I mentioned the patent pro bono program, that program is generally limited to patents. Now, with that said, some uh, participating attorneys may be willing to take on providing trademark assistance, but it is a patent pro bono program. The law school clinic, however, provides patents or trademarks or both depending on the participating law school. Next slide, please. We also have our Patent and Trademark Resource Centers, which is a, a network of over 80 libraries located nationwide where there is one or more uh, educated librarian who can serve as a resource to you, both in providing training classes, but in providing search assistance for searching patents or trademarks. These trained librarians are trained through the US Patent and Trademark Office, uh, and in fact, are right now with the office uh, having their annual conference. Um, I think we have one last, uh, two last slides, Bobby. Let's wrap it up real quickly with those and we'll get to our questions. This is just a listing of some additional resources and our helpline. Uh, and we're going to wrap it up with one last slide today. And I think it's uh, about some upcoming courses. Next slide. Ah, here we go. Just going back to our events page, I wanted to give you just a quick snapshot of some of our upcoming courses that are happening this month, just to show the diversity of the content and the diversity of the audiences they are addressing. On April 14th, What You Need to Sell Your Arts and Crafts Online, an e-commerce primer for Native American visual artists and craftspeople. April 20th, Diversifying Your Market or Supply Chain, Copyright Protection. And last but not least, and why I wanted to bring it home with this slide, is in fact on April 26th, we are celebrating the annual event of World Intellectual Property Day. I hope you will all celebrate it wildly. We do at the US Patent and Trademark Office. And in fact, we'll be having a virtual celebration that you are welcome to join us for. World Intellectual Property Day celebrates the creation of the World Intellectual Property Organization. And again, celebrates the role and importance of intellectual property across the globe. Uh, is my name is my the last slide su suggests and as I said my name is Elizabeth Doherty. Uh, I serve as the Eastern Regional Outreach Director and it's been my pleasure being with you today. I know we've run through materials um, very expeditiously, but again, hopefully it has whet your appetite for protecting your intellectual property and even more so creating intellectual property. Um, so I know we've just about run out of time, but if there are any questions, and I again, I want to thank my colleague Bobby for facilitating uh, both our slides today as well as helping with the questions uh, that may have come in uh, in the chat during our time together. Kayla, are there any questions from the audience? Yeah, um, I wasn't sure um, if Bobby was going to read them or uh, but I can, definitely. Um, so we have uh, an anonymous person asking, uh, what are the pros and cons of doing a pre-search of pre-art and claims? Okay, um, if I'm understanding the question correctly, um, the question is with regards to doing a patent search. So interestingly enough, um, prior to filing a US patent application, an applicant is not required to do a prior art search. And if you recall, when we say the term prior art, it's just a technical way of saying previously published, publicly available uh, information that is pertinent to the patentability of an invention. So that can be uh, US patents, international patents, published patent applications. It can be senior thesis documents. It can be trade journals. It can be newspapers, internet websites. 
as an applicant applying for patent, one is not required to do a patent search prior to filing. Now, with that said, we strongly encourage applicants to do so because maybe your idea is just so great, someone's already thought of it. So why not save yourself the headache, the heartache, and the financial outlay? Or additionally, by doing a patent search, one can also have a better appreciation of the field of endeavor in which you're working. Maybe by doing a patent search or prior art search, you can see how others are working in your field and you can perhaps refine your invention to invent around others or to take a different tack or to take a different approach than others working in your field. Now, with that said, if you do conduct a prior art search prior to filing a patent application, you are required under the duty of disclosure to file with your application anything that you find that you think is pertinent to the patentability of your invention. And we do this not to, not to jam you up and not to try and catch you up, but because we want the best information to be before our patent examiners when reviewing your application. So if there's something in your field of endeavor that you think should be brought to our attention, we would like you to do so. And again, that's called the duty of disclosure. Uh, great. We have a, a question about um, speaking to these three uses, uh, logo, word, and combo. Is this three trademarks? So um, one can have multiple trademarks uh, within a given, given business. I go back to our example with Coca-Cola. So um, yes, um, assuming that when you say logo, word, and combo, that you are uh, using each one of those separately as your mark, they would in fact be three separate marks. Now a company again can own multiple marks because they use them in different ways. Um, another great example is uh, think about Starbucks. Starbucks has the name Starbucks and then they have the, the green goddess or the green mermaid that has become so iconic for Starbucks. Those are used individually and they are used together. Um, so each can serve as its own mark and would require a separate application. Uh, if someone has hired someone to design their company logo, uh, should they get it registered? Do they have the right since they weren't the one that designed it? Great question. Um, so uh, if you are using it, uh, if you are using your company logo is the indicator of the source of goods and services. Again, whether you're opening a nail salon or you're going to be uh, selling toothbrushes and you want uh, there to be an indicator of the, that you are the owner of that, the creation of those goods and services, yes. And you are going to be working in interstate commerce, you should register your logo. And we would strongly encourage a federally registered trademark through the US Patent and Trademark Office. Now. With respect to ownership, that goes back to what type of an agreement you had with that creator, with that designer. Um, so I would be cautious and would encourage you to look at uh, what the agreement was you have with that creator, with that designer. Um, it was probably a work for hire. And if so, you probably have ownership in that work. But again, it would be important to go back and look at exactly how that agreement was structured when asking them to do that work for you. And there's uh, one more question currently. Uh, if you designed a program and are teaching it to your clients, would that program be eligible for protection? So I think that's an interesting question. And uh, again, I probably need to know more. Um, when you say if you designed a program, was that, is that a, a software program? Or is it a uh, program such as today's program uh, with a series of speakers? I, I'd need to know what was a, a better description of the term program. But let's say it's a, let's say you've designed a program to teach people how to, uh, uh, I can't even think of a good example, I apologize, how to uh, weave baskets. Um, you might be able to protect that um, depending. You might be able to protect your training materials by copyright. If they are in fact written down, you've created a training manual for the program of how to weave baskets, that the training manual could be protected by a, a copyright. Your company that is conducting the program, you're the you know, 
basket weavers of America. You could potentially protect your brand through a trademark. Um, and depending, you might even have something that's protectable by a trade secret or by a patent. Let's say you have invented a new way to weave baskets because you've invented a new device or a method for weaving baskets. Arguably, that could be protected by a patent. So I know that's a, a very uh, a nebulous answer of maybe or it depends. Uh, but again, we need a little bit more specificity. Uh, we have another question. If you write the lyrics for a song during a workshop and work with a musician, if you want to use another musician because you're going to change the music, would this be okay? Well, so again, I think it, it depends. So uh, again, we're not in a position to be able to provide legal advice. Um, and this is uh, definitely delving into copyright law. Um, would be a great conversation to have with somebody at the U.S. Copyright Office. So um, again, I don't want to veer into uh, providing what might constitute legal advice. Well, thank you so much, Elizabeth, and, and to Bobby for uh, progressing the slides for us and answering some of those questions. Um, I'm going to do my little end spiel now, if that's okay with everyone. Uh, you Please. will all receive an email with a link to the recording as uh, well as the slides. And if you would like to sign up for upcoming webinars or access recorded webinars, please visit virginiasbdc.org slash training. And be sure to check out the next webinar in this series, Patent Basics on Tuesday, April 12th. And thank you again so much, uh, Elizabeth, for your uh, great presentation on this topic. And I think you answered a lot of my questions. So thank you so much. Well, thank you, Kayla. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you to my colleague, Bobby Rushing. It's always a pleasure to be with the Virginia SBDC. We know you all are doing remarkable work across the state and throughout our communities to help inventors, innovators, and entrepreneurs. And it's always a pleasure to partner with you. Thanks so much for having us back. Thank you. Uh, one last thing I forgot to mention, you can access our uh, COVID Business Recovery Center on our website, which we developed to help owners not only continue business operations, but to thrive and recover. Uh, these resources are designed to be used in collaboration with your local SBDC advisors, and you can sign up for a free and confidential session by emailing help at virginiasbdc.org or via our website. So thank you all for attending, and we hope to see you at our next session.